Good evening. The opinions and statements voiced by our guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of this network. Enjoy the shows. You are listening to WBHM, digital broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. as they navigate us through the different categories of the unknown and the unexplained, including ghosts and haunted places, cryptids and monsters, aliens and UFOs, theology and mythology, metaphysics, forbidden archaeology, urban legends and folklore, conspiracies, crimes, and corruption with top analysis from the experts of these disciplines. If it's amazing, unusual, or mysterious. If it's bizarre, creepy, and fantastic. If it's unbelievable, paranormal, or supernatural. It's here on Paraversal Universe. Here are your hosts, Kevin and Jennifer. Hello everyone, whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are, welcome to Paraversal Universe, brought to you by the Northern Wisconsin Paranormal Society Limited at the Northwoods Paranormal Resource Center here in Rylander, Wisconsin. We're your hosts, Kevin and Jennifer Hello Morgan. everyone. Paraversal Universe is produced by Kat Hobson, the voice of Fate Magazine Radio over at WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. We're also heard on WCET 101.7 FM out of Columbia, South Carolina, High Point Radio 100.5 FM and 1620 AM out of New York and New Jersey, and the Rift Radio Network family based out of Lakeside, Virginia. Welcome one and all, and hello to everybody in the chat room. We look forward to your questions and comments as always. The archive for the show will be available as well. Show archives from over the years can be found in various places on the web, including our archives like page on Paraversal or on Facebook, excuse me, called Paraversal Universe Show Archives. Also check out our guest promo page, Paraversal Universe Radio, for what's upcoming in the near future. We hope everyone's doing well, as always. It's finally cooling off out there a bit. We have a fantastic show coming up. Today is another edition of the Paralogian Report. Yay! Dun, dun, dun. But first, as always, let's do our shout-outs. Uh, shout-outs go to those people who share our show banners on a regular basis or recently that we are aware of. We always appreciate it greatly, and thank you guys kindly. Uh, who do we have this week? This week we have Walt Christos, Thoughts of Christos, Rody Speak, Dennis Koch, Jason Bland, Paranormal Soup, Jamie Demlos is JJ Paranormal, Metaphysical Bounce, Howie O'Dell from The Orion Effect, Kat Hobson at WBHM, Lawrence Demiza, Jean Broida, Lisa Reynaga, The Rift, Sudan, Lori Kresslaw, Dr. Chuck Kennedy, Project PSI Institute, Ty Ward, Fate Magazine Radio, Clairvoyance, and Jock Brokus Paranormal Daily News. Thank you, one and all. Most appreciated. All righty. Welcome to the Paralogian Report, which we do once a month on average, and starting in September, we'll be doing twice a month, opposite from our Paraversal Universe interviews. The Paralogian Report is a paranormal Supernatural, esoteric, for TN, and EXO 
geopolitical fringe talk radio roundtable with news reports from various alternative outlets all over the world, academic research, news, and classic accounts of high strangeness. For this broadcast, we bring you a panel of individuals who specialize in different areas of the unknown and unexplained to give you a well-rounded analysis of the reports we will present here on the show today. And let me introduce you to our correspondents. And today we have a full house. Psychologist, ufologist, astrologist, and author Jean Breida. How are you, Jean? I'm doing great. Hi, everybody. Paranormal investigator and owner of WBHM Digital Broadcasting, our producer Kat Hobson, host of the popular Paranormal Experience, and, of course, Fate Magazine Radio. Hi, Kat. And we have, uh, I believe we have, cryptozoologist, Iroquois shaman, herbalist, and tracker Don Young. Okay, we're working on that one, everyone. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, psych- yes, we are hopeful. Psychotherapist and paranormal investigator Tom McGuire. How are you doing, Tom? I'm fine. Hi, everybody. And neuroscientist and hypnotherapist, Dr. Chuck Kennedy. Hello, folks. Alrighty. And, of course, psychic, remote viewer, and religious demonologist, Jennifer Malik. Hello. And finally, myself, paranormal historian, ufologist, and conspiracy analyst, Kevin Malik. Uh, so we are the co- correspondents for today's broadcast. Um, and our format is the same. Uh, as always, uh, one of our panel members will read a news article that they have brought to the roundtable. Then we'll go around the panel and share our perspectives concerning the story or topic. That's all there is to it. Uh, if anyone in the chat room has an opinion to say uh, on any of the stories that we present here today, uh, leave your thoughts in the comments, and we may read those as well. Uh, no guarantees, of course. It depends on the context of the comment, or the context of the content, I should say. Both, actually. Uh, but we will take note. Uh, so having said that, let's get the ball rolling here. And the first thing I want to do is address uh, uh, a death in the paranormal community. Uh, it is with a sad and heavy heart that we must inform everyone that NWPS resident theologian, Reverend Chami Guan Pond, Ph.D., has passed away at her home in Monaco, Wisconsin. Chami Guan Pond was 92 years old. Uh, she may have been the oldest active paranormal investigator uh, in the country. I, I would certainly say it's possible. And uh, as well as spiritual advisor and many other hats. Uh, even though Chami was officially retired, she was always very active and a busy person up to her passing. Yet she would always find time to, uh, or make time for someone, anyone, if they had an issue or concern. Anyone who knows her would certainly attest to this, as she has been all over the world and has touched so many lives. Uh, as for the NWPS, the Northern Wisconsin Paranormal Society, uh, as I said, she wore many hats. Uh, she was our senior member, full of wisdom, our theologian, very well versed, a holy person with a doctorate in divinity, and a respectful paranormal investigator who always respected and applied scientific methodology in her investigation. Not everyone can apply both spiritual aspects effectively along with the scientific methodology necessary for solid investigating. For many, it's either one facet or the other, but Chami did both beautifully well. She was also an experienced and respected Christian spiritual advisor, spiritual warrior, and home deliverance minister. Plus, Chami was uh, still an active member within the United Methodist Church, Church of the Pines in Minocqua, as well as the Lakeland community she lived in. Uh, and I 
I must say, Chami had an extraordinary relationship to God, his covenant with humanity and his commandments. Uh, she dedicated her life to his service and had a deep and profound connection to God's wisdom and the greater good. Uh, she literally helped countless people uh, with their spirituality throughout their life, uh, both with the positive prospects and negative uh, adversities people can face. And uh, there's so many wonderful things we can say about Chami uh, that a uh, full article is warranted and will be forthcoming. Uh, so we can share with you guys some of the amazing things that uh, she's been part of. Uh, Jennifer, myself, and Tom, uh, and Don, have all had the opportunity to investigate with Chami and and get to know her, and she is an uh, was a, a wonderful person. Um, is yeah. there anything you guys would like know, to say? Not only was she a wonderful person, an investigator, and spiritual rock for all of us and anybody that you know she was able to help through cases. She was family. This woman was nothing short of, ama- of amazing. And when we would do cases where we had home deliverances, when she would do those prayers, you could feel the presence of God behind this woman. She had the kindest heart and the sweetest soul, and she will be forever missed. I'd just like to add that um, she had so much energy, and um, she investigated right up until um, she passed away, um, you couldn't tell that she was having any difficulties at all. Um, she's her, her life. They had an article in Lakeland Times, which is a paper up here, and they had an article about certain things she's done. She she was uh, a missionary in Africa for a period of time. She. Uh, Knew Martin Luther King and, and and his family, and spent some time at his church. Um, there were numerous things that she's done that it just was amazing. Um, we're we're gonna all miss her very very much, and um, we were, we're so glad that we had a chance to be be part of her life. She uh, her parents were archaeologists. So she, uh, growing up, had a chance to go to many different countries and cultures. And uh, she also had a, a bachelor's in science, uh, in geology. Uh, and just an amazing lady all around and an amazing uh, investigator. Just as Tom said, uh, she was with us last week on an investigation, a night investigation, at 92 years old, she had has more energy than, than many people half her age. Uh, you know, uh, she never had a problem with the duration of the investigation. Uh, sharp as a whip, and and I, I guess everyone just kind of figured that she would continue on. You know, for because uh, she was such a go-getter. So uh, rest in peace to Shami Gwen Pond. It's somebody that. Uh, I, I think everybody should at least know of, or you know, know about. So, what time do we have? <clears throat> Three minutes. Well, uh, I don't know if we should. Why don't we? Uh, does anybody else have anything they wanted to add? I only put that out there. I don't know. Is Don with us yet? No. No, not yet. Okay, okay. So, um, well, in that case, let's just move along. Um, I would like to add something, if you don't mind. I just wanted to tell you that I personally am so sorry that you lost someone who was so special and so wonderful and very important to you. And I think that was a beautiful tribute that anyone would be quite honored to, to have. So, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Sounds like an amazing lady. Indeed, it's always a sad time and a time to reflect on 
the positive contributions people have made in their lives because legacy is is remembrance, isn't it, really? Yeah, yeah. You know, out of... She was also a mentor to many people. I can tell you that spiritually speaking, she was also a mentor to me. I can hear the love in your voices. Yeah, definitely. Yes, she will be missed. She will be missed. Actually... She was the one that performed the ceremony when Kevin and Jennifer got married. Yes. Wow. She married us. Yeah. And she I remember also, that. And she also performed the service when your son passed away. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, she's, she's uh, very much like family. Very much like family. Well, these are the moments that define us through our lives, aren't they? The births, the deaths, the marriages, and regrettably the divorces, but it's all part of the wheel, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Let's hope she's looking down kindly and pray for her speedy to delivery to wherever she needs to go. Amen to that. And with that... And for those who, who know her, I'm sorry for your loss. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, it is time for our first commercial break. You're listening to Paraversal Universe. We will be right back with our panel for the next segment. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Several U.S. presidents are on record talking about the UFO mystery. Yep. Presidents Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, both had UFO sightings of their own, but the current presidential campaign might be the first in which UFO disclosure has been championed by a major party candidate. DIA, CIA, it moves around, is operating a program to train psychic spies to spy and use their powers against Russia. John Ronson writes about this in The Men Who Stare at Goats. The first known sighting of a ghost took place right after Abraham Lincoln was assassinated uh, in the late 1860s during the administration of Ulysses Grant. Project Paperclip, Clinton releases it all in 1998. Possibly the unequal cooling of its surface. I say, do you still think it's a meteor, Professor? I don't know what to think. The uh, metal casing is definitely extraterrestrial. It's a place where UFO hunters and scientists gather to examine paranormal activity in the region. Some of the documents, this is bringing Nazi scientists into the United States to work here. So we fought against the Nazis, and it's not, this again is not a revelation. As early as 1947, 1946, we knew some of this, right? On the paranormal, will we see U.S. President Barack Obama's foreign policy go intergalactic in a quest for gold stolen by aliens? We'll tell you at least how the White House responded to claims the chief executive has been teleporting to Mars. But let's get to today's Capital Account. UFOs. Hauntings. Psychic abilities. Conspiracy, ESP, cryptozoology. There are many things that remain unexplained in the inexplicable world around us. And we're talking about them here, looking for answers on WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. The truth is out there. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. Welcome back from our first commercial break, everyone. This is Paraversal Universe, produced by WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Also heard on WCETFM, High Point Radio, and the Rift Radio Network. 
We're your hosts, Kevin and Jennifer Malik, and we'd like to take a minute to thank everyone who makes Paraversal Universe possible, including graphic art director Lawrence D. Misa, music theme by Matt Stenz, announcer Frank Lee, producer and owner at WBHM, Kat Hobson, also to Howie O'Dell and Lisa Renaga at, and the Rift family, and to Michael Vera at WCETFM. Thank you all for carrying our content and working together on our behalf and the behalf of our audience everywhere. And, of course, a huge thank you to God in heaven, whose strength beyond strength is stronger than all, for granting us this wonderful show and opportunity here to be with you all. Amen. Um, and appreciation to all the various platforms we are on, including iTunes, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, Twitch, YouTube, Daily Motion, Talkstream Live, TuneIn, Blog Talk, Podbean, Google Play, Mixcloud, and Paranormal Radio Livestream app, which is streamed and restreamed from various other outlets all over the world via the internet. Alrighty, this segment of Paraversal Universe is brought to you by the UFO Wisconsin Research Team, Wisconsin's alternative to MUFON, and also by the Paranormal Daily News. We now have a page and a website dedicated to Paraversal Universe, including the Paralogian Report, where our latest episodes are listed and linked. Uh, and this is Paraversal Universe, and we are in Paralogian Report mode. We are joined by fellow correspondents, psychologist Jean Breida, paranormal investigator Kat Hobson, psychotherapist Tom McGuire, and neuroscientist Dr. Chuck Kennedy. And, of course, Jennifer and myself. Uh, alrighty. So, for this segment, Gene is going to start us off. Uh, what do you have for us, Gene? Greetings, Mirthlings. Mm-hmm. I'm going to share with you a little piece I wrote and put on my own website yesterday, lightwork111.com. It's called Peace of Mind Alien Abduction Insurance, and I hope you enjoy this. Now that more Americans believe there is at least a chance that UFOs exist, be they from other worlds or our own secretive governments, a new market in alien abduction insurance has dawned while most of us weren't even looking. Since 1987... With the publication of Whitley Strieber's best-selling alien abduction book, Communion, the St. Lawrence Agency, located in Altamont Springs, Florida, has been offering alien abduction insurance, earning the company fame and glory in the 2015 Guinness World Records. After Mike St. Lawrence discovered that his homeowner's policy didn't cover UFO abductions, the Florida businessman partnered with a group of concerned friends and a strong group of Japanese investors to address the concerns of prospects like them and came up with a practical solution, UFO abduction insurance. To date, the St. Lawrence Agency has sold over 5,000 policies worldwide. The standard $10 million policy comes with $20 million double indemnity should there be extenuating circumstances for the single lifetime premium of $19.95. Of the price, St. Lawrence said, it's pretty reasonable. We want to make it so that almost anybody can afford it. Most people, however, don't purchase the policy for themselves. They buy it for somebody else, said St. Lawrence. The policy owner in such cases usually names themselves as the beneficiary. In fact, the insurance sales website gives top billing to the philanthropical nature of these policies. The perfect gift for anyone who has everything. A scrolling advertisement reads, congratulations, you found us. Now you can purchase one of the most unique gifts on the Internet. Just enter the policy holder and beneficiary below, and they will be able to say, Beam me up. I'm covered. The gotcha? 
to cash in on the perfect policy for anyone who thinks they have everything covered. The beneficiary must prove that the insured was actually abducted by extraterrestrials. Two claims, both from New York State, as it happens, have been proved and settled. Payouts are made after a claims form with information about the incident and the identity of the claimant is submitted, along with the signature of an authorized officer aboard the spacecraft. In the first case, to pay the policy's benefit in full, the abductee recovered an alien implant that was determined by a professor at MIT not to be of any earthly substance. His policy is paying him the full $10 million benefit, as promised, at a rate of $1 per year for 1 million years. (laughs) (laughs) Payment checks dated April 1st have been mailed out for the past eight or nine years, St. Lawrence reckoned. The policies have a frequent flyer exclusion that limits policyholders to one claim per policy. And there are, I'm going to skip a bit, there are contractual terms for medical coverage, which is mostly psychiatric care to cover the post-abduction readjustment period. There is sarcasm coverage to handle your immediate family only. (laughs) There is the double indemnity coverage, the $20 million, in case aliens insist on conjugal visits, etc. If they refer to the abductee as a nutritional food source or the other white meat, or if there is proof of abduction and return with a properly completed claims form. So if you are interested in shelling out a nickel short of $20, you may qualify, and uh, you can go to the website, should you care to, and sign up for this. And if you hadn't heard, returning to my article, an astounding number of people, at last count, 1.9 million have joined a Facebook page called Storm Area 51, They Can't Stop All of Us, which proposes the following game plan to bum rush one of the world's most heavily guarded military installations. Quote, we will all meet up at the Area 51 Alien Center tourist attraction and coordinate our entry. If we can Naruto run, we can move faster than their bullets. Let's see them aliens, unquote. For those of you unfamiliar with the Naruto run, as I was, it is, quote, the unique running style of the protagonist Naruto Uzumaki in the Japanese anime series Naruto, where he is often depicted sprinting with his arms stretched behind him. To date, this uh, the date for this humorously suggested suicide mission is September 20th this year. For the record, Mike St. Lawrence has warned people to stay away from Area 51. So do I. So as the U.S. Air Force, whose spokeswoman, Laura McAndrews, said, quote, Area 51 is an open training range for the U.S. Air Force, and we would discourage anyone from trying to come into the area where we train American Armed Forces. The U.S. Air Force always stands ready to protect America and its assets, unquote. The rumor down on Conspiracy Street is that it takes above top secret cosmic security clearance to get passed into Area 51, long suspected of being a scientific military base shared by aliens and humans under the cloak of government secrecy and non-accountable taxpayer funding mounting into the trillions over the past 70 years. Who among us would take out an alien and alien abduction insurance policy, I ask you? It would be yeah, a great for, gift. Right. <laughs> the gift that keeps on giving. Stocking stuffer. You know what would only be fair? If these people are planning on raiding Area 51 and abducting aliens, maybe the aliens should get in po- insurance policies against us, too. Not a bad thought. You know, I'm going to say that we actually are running um, an area, an invade Area 51 stinger here on WBHM, created by the one and only Frank Lee. 
and I'm going to be so disappointed when September 20th passes because, A, I don't think there's going to be anybody much showing up. I and think everybody's going to show up and party, party, but go ahead. Actually, they're not because um, they have removed the, they were trying to say it was going to be a music festival. Uh-huh. And so that has been revoked. Uh-huh. It's going to be interesting because, quite frankly, a man was killed there in January. That's right. As he was encroaching upon the property. Yep. Yes. And but it's an interesting notion that what if a million people stormed Area 51? I'm just saying what I'm not advocating this, people. I'm just saying, as a scientist, I, I play what if games. Well, and I'm not what the if only would one. Be, I was just you know, he's listening going to, to lead David the Ike. And David Ike was saying the the few sheep uh, shepherds, the few shepherds control, guide, lead the the milling masses. And these what if scenarios, this is what this person behind Area 51, they can't get us all if we if we bum rush them. They can't. Uh, it sounds ridiculous. It was meant as a joke originally, of course. It was. But it was originally it, supposedly attributed left, to Heather Wade. If a million people did yeah. mass run Naruto style or otherwise, there's, I mean, what are they, I mean, really, if it turned into a bloodbath, what would that say about the American military industrial complex and the, the fact that the purpose behind this is to see them aliens to get mm-hmm. over this 70 year cover up of undeniable alien truth i get very impassioned were that were I that to the be the case there would not be than... any video because drones would be taken down and there would be no one left so yeah, it that would be interesting yeah I think the whole thing was started by the Air Force because they need to test a new secret weapon for crowd <laughs> control and they needed a crowd there you well, go. I thought it might be started by the restaurateurs, the concessions in the little towns around, because what I read recently was the all these businesses are gearing up for the hungry hordes. And I thought that would be brilliant uh, marketing for tourism. Until and all you get the people that true. actually are going you to know? charge the gate and die. I mean, you know, yeah. this I'm is crazy. That may be true. I'm afraid Absolutely that may be true. Absolutely it's true. They're not going to allow yeah. that. That's why it's been secret for so long. military base is an act of terrorism, and somebody's going to die. Yeah. But it it can also be spun as an act of martyrdom for truthdom, I suppose. Well, it's not a martyr when you can't have anything proving that that happened. I mean, there's not going to be evidence. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be a a thing. I can't disagree with that, but it w- is a testament. It would be a testament of faith. And I don't like that word in this context because I don't think, I don't think I'm a believer in UFOs. I'm a believer that my government knows they exist. That's what I believe. Well, sure they do. So yeah. this is what bum rushing, this is what amassing around Area 51 is meant to draw public attention to, in my opinion that we're tired, many of us are very tired of the big lie where UFOs don't exist, or if they do, they're all made by humans. There are no extraterrestrial intelligences, blah, blah, blah. We're just tired of it. Well, it's coming out as we speak. I mean, they are acknowledging, they are doing stuff. There is a huge push. Um, Chase Klotsky is actually getting time in front of congressional leaders relevant to the topic as are the people from TTSA it's no longer just you know oh yes we'll go home we know we'll listen when you tell us it's just that there are actual whistleblowers now involved and pushing for this release and it doesn't seem to be being fought against very much anymore they've already acknowledged they exist they're not saying they're extraterrestrial, but they will. So, Kevin, wanted to you say? Hey, Jennifer, Jennifer yes. I have a feeling on September 21st, we're going to get a mad rush of requests for missing persons. You know what? I, a good I point. Part of me wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> Did you have anything you wanted to add, Tom? This, well, maybe the, maybe the aliens and the base will make a mad rush to escape. There you go. 
Wow. And, oh, I just wanted to add about that uh, insurance policy that you mm-hmm. talked about. Um, that that um, um, if any any abductees are in the North Woods of Wisconsin, I offer <laughs> uh, free counseling if they have PTSD from the abduction. Excellent, Kevin. That is, and that's serious, and that's awesome. Yeah. Um, that is awesome. And, you know, I read this article as tongue-in-cheek, but there is a deeper layer, the fact that people would even jokingly buy insurance about alien objection, and I think a lot of people are not even joking about buying it. I believe, I tend to believe people who say they've been abducted. Now, there's lots of theories about what's really causing these abductions, including military forces or whatever, evil government forces. I don't know enough about it, but I tend to believe people give them the benefit of the doubt until proven otherwise, shall we say, which is not to say that every person claiming this is telling, uh, I believe they're telling the truth as they know it. Tom, you've probably heard a lot about this, and you could weigh in on this. Don't you think that people are reporting as accurately as possible what they perceive as having experienced the best way they can? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah I agree. Just even seeing some people on TV get that get interviewed, you could tell um, that that they have uh, PTSD symptoms and they do need help. Mm-hmm. So I jotted some stuff down while you're reading this, because uh, my first question was, how do you? Go- I mean, before you had gotten to that point, was how how can you validate this? And I suppose if they're willing to acknowledge uh, uh, professionals with with you know amazing claims need amazing evidence, and if there were such, but. The, the whole idea of a dollar a year shows its intentions. Yes, and, on April 1st, April right. Fool's Day. The, there's no way to, to collect anything. So, like, if even if the people are serious and they're paying ex, you know, they're pay, they're paying into it, they're never going to get anything out of it. They're not going to get their their uh, psychiatric bills taken care of. Uh, maybe no, it's the landscaping because a UFO trashed your yard, or <laughs> you know, who who knows what. But I blush to say it's a gag gift. Exactly. Yeah. That's, and a publicity uh, stunt for the insurance people. True. Yeah. Oh, and the other thing I wrote down is, uh, as far as the Area 51 parasociology story, right, um, it was at $3.5 million. Yes. Now, I seen yesterday, or no, two days ago, I said that it was pulled off of Facebook, but then yesterday, which was the following day, I came across it. And yeah, they put it back. It was going. a mistake, they said. They said pulling it from Facebook was a mistake. Three and a half million, did you say? Yes. Yep. Oh, my word. Million. Yeah. Yep. So, and I, I hit going because I want to at least, you know, I want to see the posts because it's. Oh, sure. Yeah. They're fascinating. They are. This is interesting sociology. Right. Right. Exactly. The parasociology in this right. uh, is is profound actually i mean this is a big deal for parasociology you know what i want to say really too really quick too on this topic before we move on is that you know i worry about the people that go there so you get a handful of people that actually do that you know i've seen videos of people on youtube saying um oh the sign's not there anymore so they can't they can't do anything to us just because the sign isn't there does not mean that they still don't have special orders Right. And I think right. we learned and, in January they're serious. And with that, it is time for our next commercial break. You are listening to Paraversal Universe. We'll be right back with our panel for the next segment. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. To the believer, the evidence is overwhelming. To the skeptic, there will never be enough. Hello everyone. Join Kevin and Jennifer Malik, the host of Paraversal Universe, every Friday here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Also heard on WCET FM and The Rift. Log on or tune in as they check out the mysteries found within the eight categories of the unknown and unexplained, including ghosts and haunted places, aliens and UFOs, theology and mythology, cryptids and monsters, 
urban legends and folklore, conspiracies, metaphysics, and forbidden archaeology. Listen as Kevin and Jennifer interview the top minds in their respective fields as they share theories and information regarding these unsolved mysteries. For future show and archive information, one can find Paraversal Universe on Facebook, Twitter, and MeWe under various Paraversal Universe headings. So, for excellent talk radio about the unknown and unexplained, check out Paraversal Universe, where all paranormal perspectives apply. Brought to you by the Northern Wisconsin Paranormal Society, LTD, and produced by WBHMDB.com. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 45 minutes after the hour. Welcome back from our second break. This is Paraversal Universe on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Also heard on WCETFM, High Point Radio, and the Rift Radio Network. We're your hosts, Kevin and Jennifer Malik. Before we get back to the show, we want to tell you all that we are on MeWe and Twitter. Our like and group pages on Facebook are under various headings as well. Having said that, check out our society's like page on Facebook, the Northern Wisconsin Paranormal Society Limited, as well as Jennifer's like page, Jennifer Malik, Psychic Demonologist. Leave a like if you like what you see. We always appreciate it. And uh, this segment is brought to you by... Uh, our fellow parapsychologist and ufologist, Gene Breida's latest book, Unknown Objects and Top 10 UFO, Top 10 US UFO Cases. Of course, uh, Gene is with us today. And also, uh, the book Trail of the Sasquatch, A Shaman's Journey by cryptozoologist and Iroquois shaman Don Young. He's also a member of the NWPS and, uh, uh, member or correspondent for the Paralogian Report, um, and we were having technical difficulties getting him on for this episode. So uh, I'm sure he'll be with us next time. Any comments for this week's show can be addressed in the live chat room. Let's get back to the show. This is Paraversal Universe <coughs> and the Paralogian Report, Fringe News and Analysis. And for this segment, Tom is going to uh, bring his article to the table. Exactly. So what do you have for us, Tom? Well, because we run into a lot of cases in the Northern Wisconsin Paranormal Society that um, there's hauntings in in houses, some residences that have um, children. Uh, I found this article, and I tried to hand it out to um, our clients that do have children. So I'm going to read the article, and it's the title of it is Discussing Ghosts with Your Children, with Your Kids. Okay, parents, here's the problem. You think your house may be haunted from strange cold spots to hearing voices, maybe even seeing the apparitions of a person you know doesn't belong in your home. To compound the problem, you have children. And there's no such thing as ghosts, is there? So how do we talk to our children when we feel the house that we live in may have an unseen extra tenant or two? Many of us were raised being told that ghosts aren't real. But as adults, we've learned we're not so sure. Trust us, kids aren't so sure ghosts aren't real either. The good news is that popular culture has already started a discussion for us. The notion of ghosts being real is presented on many television shows, on countless websites, in hundreds of books, on radio programs, and in magazines. From a young age, we're intrigued by the notion of ghosts because the supernatural has been part of our culture, part of our collective psyche, and in archetype across cultures for many millennia. Ghosts are a way for all of us, especially children, to ponder the inevitable fact that all of us will die one day, and we 
we have to deal with what may come after. We can ignore ghosts, but the subject will not go away. If you feel you may be living with a spirit or a specter, talk to your children about what is happening as a, is a touchy and uncomfortable subject. In years of talking with families who believe their house is haunted, through discussion with countless other paranormal investigators who have helped families with similar situations and in consulting with psychology experts, one conclusion, one conclusion is indisputable. Those who openly discuss this, their situation among family members are much better off than the families who don't speak about the odd things happening in their home. For example, often in a haunting, the witness believes that maybe the phenomenon is only happening to them and them alone. Maybe they're losing their minds. Maybe the entity is singling them out. When one family member finally confides in another, I think I've been seeing ghosts in our house. There is often a great moment of relief that comes over both people. You've seen it too, is sometimes the reply. Once the discussion is out in the open, then you have group support, which helps immensely. Remember, fear comes from the unknown. Most hauntings are benign, but we're afraid because seeing a ghost is not something we encounter every day. Some understanding will help lower the fear factor. To open the discussion with children, you do need to be careful. Your home is your castle and is a place where you and your children should always feel safe. Young children believe that their parents are both perfect and invincible. As a parent, you know you're far from it, but it's important. You'll need to base your discussion on the maturity level of your own child, children, but here are some guidelines. Age three and four, young children will be less scared than older children because almost everything in their environment is normal to them. At this age, parents don't need to say anything more than, we may have someone else living in our house with us. You can't see this person, but it's okay. You're safe, and mom and dad will take care of everything. Your child will believe you because you've been taking care of them almost all their needs up to this point in their life. They have complete faith in your abilities. Now, if you get to age five, seven, the facts, but be ready for a question or two because children this age are becoming more independent and have questions regarding the world around them. Just like with your three or four year old, assure the child they're safe and you're monitoring the situation. Answer only the questions your child asks and be brief. Going on and on with theories, ideas, and possibilities about why won't sink into the ch child this age and may lead to further confusion. Ages 8 to 12. At this age, you want to announce the issue, reassure, reassure the child, and offer a few details as to how you're working the issue. For example, we believe we may have a ghost in the house. Everything is okay. No one is going to get hurt. To get some help, we've called in some investigators who deal with, with things like this. Do you have any questions? Again, answer only the question you're asked and don't go on with it. Age is 13 and up. At this age, you should be as open about the subject as you would with another adult friend or neighbor. Your objective during the, these discussion is to reassure your child that you're in charge and have the situation under control and you want to create a context where the child feels safe and secure and can ask questions if they have them. If you do bring in a paranormal investigation team to check out your situation, um, kids.ghostvillage.com recommends that you not allow the investigators to explain the situation to your own children. It should always be the filter for information that goes to your children. Though your investigators may be professional and sincere, they don't know your child as well as you do, and they have their own beliefs and agenda. 
an analogy we like to use is, what if there has been burglaries in your neighborhood? Or what if one of the parents has a stalker? Keep your child safe and secure as your highest priority. You tell the child what is happening, not the police. In 1943, psychologist Abraham, Abraham Maslow established a pyramid of human needs. At the base is phys- physiological needs, such as food and water, and the next tier up is safety, protection, and security. Without safety and security, the child can't move into the higher developmental tiers like social needs, love, self-esteem, and self-actualization. And without secure and safety, no one can function very well as a person. (laughs) Your child's safety and security is your priority. What if you believe there is danger? In most rare hunting cases, in more rare hunting cases, People in the location are afraid for their safety. This requires immediate attention. In those more, more extreme cases, you need a solution to the problem. If you live in a neighborhood with a rash of crimes, in some cases, your best plan, if it's possible, is to remove the child from the situation. Maslow's hierarchy of needs also applies to adults. If you don't feel safe, you are going to become an emotionally charged individual. The more emotionally charged situation, the more perceptions matter with family members. Because of the constant fear, you're not thinking straight, nor acting in your best interest. You need help and you need to fast. Every situation is unique. There is no magic pill you can take and no silver bullet cured to to these kinds of situations. The more extreme your haunting, the more of the following steps you should incorporate into your health plan. Call in a reputable paranormal investigation team. Find a group that can verify or dispute some of the phenomena you're experiencing. Get a psychologist involved. You're going through a stressful situation and you need some help in dealing with it. Family therapy is a wonderful addition to your health plan. Keep your spiritual advisor appraised of the situation. Whether you're priest, rabbi, minister, imam, monk, or other clergy, tell them that you're going through, ask for them to, for prayers and blessing or clearing or any other religious procedure they feel might help. Also see your medical doctor. Make sure the medications you're taking are causing hallucinations. Make sure you're in good physical health. You'll need all your faculties to deal with this situation. Work this issue for every, from every angle and you will see improvement. There's some do's and don'ts. Don't take illegal drugs or drink excessive amounts of alcohol if you believe your haunting may be dangerous. Do talk, do take walks, exercise and get out of the house regularly to clear your head. Do eat well, take care of your body, you'll need it. Do attend religious services. Get some sleep. If your sleep is affected, you're not functioning properly. See if your family can spend a few nights with relatives or in a hotel, if that's what it takes. It's important to remember that you're not alone. Other families have gone through what you're experiencing. There are ways to get help, to understand what is happening, and to move forward. One place to start is a special forum, ghostvillage.com's main site. There you can share your stories and network with other families who are going through something similar. That's the end of the article. I thought it was really good advice in a lot of different ways. So I'm in the habit of handing it out to families if we have an investigation with the family. I believe it isn't Ghost Village, isn't that uh, Jeff Bellinger? Yes. Yes. Well, we have uh, uh, like two minutes right. before. All right, so why don't we pick our commercial break now? And then discuss. Yeah, and we can discuss it when we come back. Is everybody okay with that? I'm good with that. Okay. Absolutely. So you are listening to Paraversal Universe. We will be right back with our panel for the next segment. 
chance to come together. I'm Lisa Brady, Fox News. President Trump saying that about the renewed gun control debate after the mass shootings in Ohio and Texas. There's been no president that feels more strongly about the Second Amendment than I do. However, we need meaningful background checks so that sick people don't get guns. After speaking with congressional leaders from both parties and the CEO of the NRA this week, the president says he believes something can get done. And he's just tweeted that serious discussions between House and Senate leadership are taking place. In El Paso, police say the man accused of killing 22 people at a Walmart confessed as he surrendered and also admitted he was targeting Mexicans. That information coming today from an arrest warrant affidavit. The 21-year-old suspect has been charged with capital murder, still being held without bond. Federal prosecutors have said they're also considering hate crime charges. The latest candidate on the soapbox at the Iowa State Fair is focusing on money and corruption in politics. You cannot look to the conventional political establishment to fix the problem. They are the problem. It is time for the people to step in. Author Marianne Williamson speaking moments ago. Earlier, Julian Castro announced a plan to fight hate and domestic terrorism that includes a ban on assault-style weapons. The family of Michael Brown marking five years since the 18-year-old was killed by a police officer during a confrontation in Ferguson, Missouri. Justice has not been served. My son deserves to, to live a full life. Michael Brown Sr. wants the investigation reopened. The police officer, who was not charged in Brown's death, resigned after the shooting. This is Fox News. At TD Ameritrade, they're reinventing how you invest. Whether you want to place a trade on Facebook Messenger or get market news from your smart speaker, TD Ameritrade's technology is designed to bring the market to you. See what's new at tdameritrade.com slash innovation. Member SIPC. Day three of the manhunt for a convicted child abuser, Curtis Ray Watson, who's now also accused of murder since escaping from a Tennessee prison. Tennessee has issued a rare blue alert in the hunt for Watson. That is issued when a member of law enforcement is killed or seriously wounded in the line of duty. Watson is the chief suspect in the murder of a prison administrator, Deborah Johnson, 64 years old. She was the mother of three, the grandmother of seven. Watson apparently made his escape by tractor. He was on farm duty inside the prison at the time of his escape Wednesday morning, just north of Memphis. That tractor was found about one mile from the prison, and now officials are warning residents in western Tennessee to keep their eyes alert for any sign of Watson. Fox is Steve Harrigan. Watson was serving a 15-year sentence in a kidnapping case. A protest planned Saturday in one Florida community over plans to put a Confederate statue there. Not in my backyard. That's what opponents are saying over plans to relocate a statue of Confederate General Edmund Kirby Smith. They're planning to march in protest through downtown Tavares, about 40 miles northwest of Orlando. This after commissioners there approved moving the statue from the U.S. Capitol in Washington to the Lake County Historical Society Museum in Florida. A statue of African-American educator Mary McLeod Bethune will replace the Confederate statue in Washington. Tom Graham, Fox News. Federal officials say evidence from electronic monitoring bracelets shows people who had already been arrested for immigration violations and were not allowed to work in the U.S. were working at all seven chicken processing plants that were raided Wednesday in Mississippi. This according to documents unsealed in federal court yesterday. About half of the nearly 700 detained were released, some on humanitarian grounds, because they had children to care for. Lisa Brady, Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Welcome back to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is five minutes after the hour. 
Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Paraversal Universe, now in our second hour, produced by WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. Also heard on the Rift Radio Network out of Virginia, WCETFM out of South Carolina, and High Point Radio on the top of New Jersey. We're your hosts, Kevin and Jennifer Malik, coming to you from Rylander, Wisconsin, here at the USA at the Northwoods Paranormal Resource Center. You can always enjoy excellent fringe talk radio for awesome and informative radio shows about the paranormal, supernatural, esoteric, and for TN topics on this network and affiliate platform websites. Not only our show, but many other good shows about different facets of the unknown and unexplained. Much to listen to and much to enjoy. Stream live on TuneIn, iTunes, and the Paranormal Livestream app. Available from Android app in the iTunes store. This segment is brought to you by the Supernatural Magazine, where our articles can be read. And uh, this is Paraversal Universe and the Paralogian Report, which covers news, history, and analysis about the topics from the fringe recesses of the world. The paranormal, supernatural, for TNR esoteric. And uh, today's correspondents include psychologist and astrologist Jim Broida, paranormal investigator Kat Hobson, psychotherapist Tom McGuire, cryptozoologist and shaman Don Young, who cannot be with us today, uh, neuroscientist and hypnotherapist Dr. Chuck Kennedy, PhD, psychic and religious demonologist Jennifer, and myself. So, all right, and this is the Paralogian Report. And when we went, before we went to commercial break in the last hour, uh, Tom had brought a, a really good article uh, to the table regarding talking to your children about uh, ghosts and, and paranormal activity. And uh, there was a bunch of good points. Yeah. I... As, as I do anytime I, I listen to the articles, I like to jot stuff down just so I don't forget. Um, and I think uh, one of the things for sure that's really important when you're working with families in paranormal cases is allevi- helping, giving them knowledge and information and helping them alleviate the fear factor. Uh, that is important. I also feel uh, when, when, there's respect for the parasociology involved in the case, uh, and it can be communicated with the parents so they understand that they need, uh, or, or it's better to talk with their children and take, a, 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 you know, uh, do their role as a parent and, and, you know, listen to them, listen to what they're saying. That kind of thing, if, if the children feel like they're, uh, you know, not being ignored or not believed or whatever, uh, they'll be more comfortable overall in their environment and with everything else. And that will in turn affect the whole family for, for positive. Uh, so yeah, the family unit, when the family unit's in strong and in agreement and in unison, it's way better. Because then you're also, again, the unit itself is stronger, and that will help in itself. Uh, and uh, respecting the entities is important, I think. Um, and anything, I and the last thing I wrote down is uh, energy in and energy out, just meaning that uh, the more energy you put into investigating the ghosts in your house, the more likely paranormal activity will happen. So that's something that you, uh, everyone's got to decide, of course. Uh, sometimes it, it's, it's just the most respectful thing is not to poke the bear with the stick if it's not necessary. Yeah. Yes. Um, but then were my thoughts on it. And I think it was a wonderful article. It was. I think it's one that every researcher or investigator should have in their kit. Absolutely. I thought it was yes. wonderful. I, totally and I think one of the 
ahead. One of the key points that I took away from that was you talk to your children. Don't let the team that comes into your house talk to your children because their philosophy, their background, and just their vocabulary may be confusing to the child. Yes. And your goal is to let your child feel safe in their own home, and you're the best person to do that. Great point. Well, I like you're the approach first. of taking with the kids, this is, a, this is an intrusion. We're talking about an intruder event to kind of normalize it a bit. And, and the point also that you made, Tom, quite correctly, that with kids, everything's new. All experiences are new. Their perception is different. We know that kids see things that adults don't. They have vivid imaginations, for one thing, and there's something to be said for their being able – well, a lot of people claim that kids are psychic up to about the age seven or so when they start using language, spoken language. And this is a topic that almost never gets covered, so I'm glad that you're covering this, Tom. Yeah, I, I'm glad, too, because, you know, when you look about the innocence factor of kids, I mean, they haven't – you know, you get these kids that are really, really young – that haven't been exposed to the world yet and go through this, it, it could be confusing for them. And of course they're going to have questions. And I just think this was just an awesome article. And yes, I think this is what should be done when it, when it comes to families with children who see ghosts. Absolutely. I'm glad you brought that. I think that. it Thank happens you. more often than we realize. So it's, it's an important issue. Well, I just yeah, can appreciate you, you sharing being, that. And can you imagine being teased at school as the kid who lives in the haunted house? Ha ha. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I think every class had one kid that had to play that role. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Not as bad as some of the others, given the popularity of ghost hunting at this time. So, yeah. True. you know, could. <laughs> My family was one of those growing up. Everyone knew our house in the neighborhood as being the haunted house. Wow. So. Well, so did you spin that toward cool and groovy? Of course, I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> right. You got to make lemonade, right? So. Absolutely. So next up, we have Kat. All righty. Well, I shared when we were discussing which one we were going to go with, um... I shared a couple of them, and I actually found the same subject matter written in a way that I like better. So, this this is interesting because, you know, now we've got a much better chance of finding life on the moon. <laughs> and so, this is from themindunleashed.com, which is one of my favorite web pages, And it is really really terrific it's the crashed israeli spaceship left thousands of tardigrades on the moon and i had no idea that the israelis had a space program and were doing this kind of research i found that itself fascinating but i digress <laughs> um an israeli spacecraft called the Bereshit almost made it to the moon in april it took a selfie with the lunar surface in the background, then lost contact with Earth and presumably crashed onto the lunar surface. Now it's been revealed that the mission was carrying a cargo of, cargo of dehydrated microscopic life forms known as the Tardigrads. And let's see, Bear Sheet was the first stage of a privately funded initiative to transfer living DNA to the moon. The project is designed to act as Noah's Ark Mark II, providing a repository from which plants and animals could be regenerated to repopulate the Earth should a ca catastrophe akin to a flood of biblical proportions overtake the planet. Whether the pro project is farsighted or foolish, what has roused interests is the fact that as a result of the crash, the creatures may now be scattered across the lunar surface. They are hardly hardy creatures and could probably survive on the moon for a long time. Is this a matter of concern? I believe so, but possibly not for the reasons you think. Tardigrads are odd little creatures. Measuring, about, measuring up to about half a millimeter long, they have four pairs of stubby legs and a front end that 
Even the fondest parent could not describe as beautiful. Striking or distinctive are my adjectives of choice. Moon-faced would be appropriate given the context of the story with a round, sucker-like structure in the center that can project outwards, revealing a set of dangerous-looking sharp teeth. They're often called water bears, but the images of them that I have seen remind me of a slightly overinflated blimp, one of those large balloons that float overhead at carnivals. The legs stick out at a slight angle as if they're too swollen to stand upright, and that is probably the clue as to why it is extremely unlikely that the creatures will survive indefinitely on the moon. Tardigrades can survive extremes of temperature and pressure, including the frigid vacuum of space. They don't seem to mind being exposed to radiation and are all around tough little creatures. When dehydrated, they roll up into a spore-like state that slows down their metabolic rate by about a hundredfold, enabling them to survive for potentially over a hundred years. But to live their life to the fullest requires water. It's where they get their oxygen and food, typically colonizing clumps of algae or burrowing into sediment to ingest nutrients from the fluid of other living, living creatures, even others of their species. So while the tardigrades will technically stay alive in the moon for some length of time in their rolled up state, unless they are rescued, rehydrated, and fueled, they will eventually perish. Now, I'm not concerned about polluting the moon with organisms that might reanimate. My concern is about polluting the moon full stop. There is already a fairly sizable amount of debris from redundant spacecraft and litter left behind by astronauts. As more missions are planned to the moon, eventually with human passengers and perhaps even settlements, we must learn to clean up as we go along. Otherwise, we are going to have the sort of crisis we are seeing on Earth with the outcry about environmental damage from plastics. There is, though, another question to consider. What if the spacecraft had crashed as it approached Mars rather than the moon? The planet has had a poor record for successful landings, although it has much improved in the past decade. Would the tardigrades have survived atmospheric entry? Even though the atmosphere of Mars is thin, it still provides sufficient resistance to cause serious damage to the outer shell of an entry vehicle. And this does go on about the weather for a bit. But Mars has been found to have had water. And while these creatures are survivalists, basically, they live on fluids derived from other beings. And as far as we know, there are no living beings on Mars. But we keep sending spacecraft to look for life. Sending a target, a cargo of tardigrades to Mars would be irresponsible, even if we don't believe they would survive irresponsible because Mars has the potential for life. Restricted life for sure, but we have no right to endanger that life, and we have a responsibility to maintain Mars as close to pristine as possible, exploring it with care. That is why space agencies take such stringent precautions about spacecraft construction. The rooms in which the craft are built are cleaner and more sterile than any operating theater. They take every precaution to ensure that no terrestrial life is transferred to Mars. NASA and ESA are currently planning a mission to return samples from Mars to Earth, and precautions about the possibility of returning Martian life to Earth with the rocks are central to the design and build of the spaceship. Last week, we had an asteroid passing close to the Earth. Next week, it, maybe it will be killer bees or a plague of thieving magpies. But for now, it is water bears on the moon. We should let them shrivel slowly into oblivion. And... You know, if you look at the pictures of these things, they are so ugly, they're almost cute, but not quite. (laughs) And, you know, they're they're now out there with the possibility of becoming one with their environment. And should we not be correct about the structure of the environment of the moon, if they get access to fluids, they're back. And when I first read this, my my first yeah i'm a star trek fiend so <laughs> the original series but yeah. you know i'm like oh dear heavens it's going to be you know the triples all over again <laughs> so you know this is just an example they go on on much more about the environmental effect but 
you know, that runs both ways. I too am concerned about what we may bring back from an environment. I'm concerned about what we're reanimating here on earth that we're finding in the ice flows. But what do y'all think? Do you think that, you know, when we go back to the moon, we're going to find the, the tribbles flowing everywhere? Or is this just irresponsible behavior? What's your take on it? Well, I think that uh, it, it's so tough to tell with the moon. It's so tough to tell with the information we're given regarding the moon and regarding what's going on there and what has happened before and, what's, and, and what future intentions are. And uh, I, I don't always know what to believe. You know, I, I know the moon is real. I see it. At least I think it's real. I would assume it's on a hologram or some weirdness. Um, so as, as far as I, I can't, you know, uh, of course going, uh, in school we were taught it was, uh, a natural satellite of the planet caused by impact from, uh, uh, hitting the planet, I should say. And then there was a double whack theory, mm-hmm. which is kind of like, uh, okay, you know, um, I don't even know if it's a, a natural satellite or, or something uh, different. You know what I'm saying? So I, I for me, I, I have it, – it's one of those things I just follow. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. It's, it's interesting. If you think about all the stuff that they're doing in laboratories in secret, you know, in the deep state, underground, all that – some of the the things they're messing with, you know, diseases. And... I know. They're reanimating these things. And they yeah. just had to close the military base um, testing facility because they were not compliant. They had, they had exposure. And, you know... If we're doing that here, what are we going to do to other places? We go, we are going to be the people that get banned from astral travel. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. Well, you, you kind of have to wonder, too, if if these creatures are left up on the moon, it's a whole new environment for them, mm-hmm. and how will they mutate? And then yes. we go back and we pick these buggers up and they've mutated. You know, how is that going to impact us when, when they're brought back? And, and if we go back to the moon, they're going to be brought back. Mm-hmm. And it just, I think it was irresponsible to do that. Yes. And it underscores really the need, or at least they pre- some people perceive a need to, I blush to say, plat the moon. I, I listen to realtors and lawyers, real estate lawyers, 25 years ago at a science fiction mm-hmm. convention, licking their lips, talking about squaring off the moon into grids and selling it off to the highest bidders. And one has, to, I've been writing articles about what has changed with the moon. We had this huge, we had this long period of time with no activity, nobody going to the moon, and then all of a sudden, China, Japan, other countries saying, we're going to the moon and going to the moon and in they're very there. short order. They're yes, there. It... They've gone. They're going to the far side, the near side. They're doing this. They're doing that. Experiments. And as you say, cat releasing organisms on the moon. Mm-hmm. I mean, what gives them the right? It, when you the the best analogy on Earth would be Antarctica. Yes, it would. The frozen continent, where there is no continental government. Jurisdiction of Antarctica is shared by by a whole bunch of nations. I forget how yes, many. Yes, they are. A list and of ev- nations. A leader from every nation has been there in the past two years, too. Every yeah, nation, including the Vatican. And, inclu- and at, yes. a, at contact in the desert, there was a guy who stood up. He showed his military documentation. He said, I was trained. Mm-hmm. I went in as a teenager. I, because I was, I wanted to be military and I got trained as a doctor and I was put doing alien tissue sample analysis, necropathy or something it's called, basically analyzing 
tissues of, well, mostly dead beings, but he said he also worked on live beings. And then they teleported to other worlds. And is this guy pulling our legs? He seemed entirely genuine. And he's not alone. There's many people, insiders of secret space programs, not the secret space space program, but lots of them apparently. Or it may all be the same thing. But insiders, whether they're well, telling that's where the Corey truth or Gate not, came from, was talking about that. Quite. His experience and this with guy that. is in. I, I was going to say in league with Corey Good. I'm not sure that's a fair statement. He's another another facet of Corey goods experience another mm-hmm. aspect of it and this guy as a scientist seems quite credible as a medical doctor seems we have a credible. commercial we need to address yeah so why don't we continue this discussion after our next commercial break you're listening to paraversal universe this is the paralogian report and we'll be right back with our panel for the next segment Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The opinions of hosts and guests do not necessarily reflect the opinion of this network. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello. I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal. From ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond, you'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. To the believer. The evidence is overwhelming. To the skeptic, there will never be enough. Hello, everyone. Join Kevin and Jennifer Malik, the host of Paraversal Universe, every Friday here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Also heard on WCET FM and The Rift. Log on or tune in as they check out the mysteries found within the eight categories of the unknown and unexplained including ghosts and haunted places, aliens and UFOs, theology and mythology, cryptids and monsters, urban legends and folklore, conspiracies, metaphysics, and forbidden archaeology. Listen as Kevin and Jennifer interview the top minds in their respective fields as they share theories and information regarding these unsolved mysteries. For future show and archive information, one can find Paraversal Universe on Facebook, Twitter, and MeWe under various Paraversal Universe headings. So, for excellent talk radio about the unknown and unexplained, check out Paraversal Universe, where all paranormal perspectives apply. Brought to you by the Northern Wisconsin Paranormal Society, LTV, and produced by WBHMDV.com. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 45 minutes after the hour. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. Alrighty, everybody. We are back from our commercial break. This is Paraversal Universe, produced by WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Also heard on WCET FM and the Rift Radio Network. We're your hosts, Kevin and Jennifer Malley. Before we get back to the show, let's take a quick moment during this hour to specifically mention the radio call dials for the AM FM terrestrial stations who carry Paraversal Universe, including WCET, which is on 101.7 FM out of Columbia, South Carolina, and on High Point Radio, 
which can be found on 100.5 FM and 1620 AM out of New Jersey, which broadcast in New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. So hello to all of you who are turning in over the airwaves. Thank you so much. We're glad you are with us, and we are glad everybody is with us uh, on the Internet, on all the different platforms, streaming the show, uh, listening to the archives, all of it. Thank you for joining us. And this segment, interestingly, is brought to you by the uh, is brought to you by the Parasociology like page on Facebook. Parasociology is a study of how paranormal manifestations and experiences can affect a family, group, or collective. Parasociology also examines how spirituality is practiced in different cultures. So go check that out and leave a like for future content. All right, back to the show. This is Paraversal Universe and the Paralogian Report. We're joined by psychologist and ufologist Gene Broida, paranormal investigator and producer Kat Hobson, psychotherapist and paranormal investigator Tom McGuire, neuroscientist and hypnotherapist Dr. Chuck Kennedy, and, of course, Jennifer and myself. So this... Uh, segment. Uh, actually, we were, is, uh, we, did anyone else want to comment before we switch to the next topic? Yeah. On the last, uh, on, on the one we just said? Because we kind of like, no, I, I guess that's a no. Right. Okay, so we'll just move on. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so, um, it's my turn. And, you know, we were talking about parasociology before and uh, how important it, uh, the role it is, or the, the, how important it can be. And, uh, and of course, uh, Tom touched on it with his article. And we just uh, talked about the like page for parasociology and I, the article I have is called the diversity of parasociology and this is uh, Supernatural Magazine and uh, this is by Jennifer and myself so this is uh, there are many disciplines or fields of study in the unknown and unexplained each one specializes and focuses on specific categories and topics within their own areas of expertise. Although certain fields may interact with each other at times, it's not always a commonality. For example, cryptozoologists don't generally hunt ghosts. Demonologists don't usually skywatch for UFOs. Archaeologists don't usually conduct seances. And parapsychologists don't perform exorcisms, etc. However, there is one field which can interact with every other field in the unexplained equally, and this would be parasociology. Since when you're not aware of this unique field of research, let's define uh, what exactly parasociology is. Parasociology is a branch of uh, paranormal research dedicated to examining how paranormal manifestations, activity, or events can affect a family unit, collective, or a group, a group being a number of people who identify and interact with one another. Parasociology also studies how different cultures on the planet practice spirituality. So what makes parasociology so diverse and why does it interact with every other field of the unexplained equally? Uh, this is because no matter what field of research in the unknown and unexplained we're talking about, they all have social implications. Parasociology can look at each type of paranormal paranormal malady perceived, experience, and how it affects a group, a family unit, or society in general. And even though parasociologists are uh, a rarer breed, we are personally aware of different parasociologists who focus their attentions on different disciplines. For example... Uh, one specializes in studying the parasociological aspects of ufology, while another one uh, looks at uh, metaphysics. 
And another one we know uh, examines implications in cryptozoology. Uh, not to not not to say they don't uh, study parasociological implications in other disciplines as well, but these are their primary focuses and topic of interest. So, in fact, every field in the paranormal has parasociological implications, not just those four mentioned. Parasociology can apply to all of the categories we find in the unknown and unexplained. And when one looks deeper into parasociology, we can also divide the groups for individual study. One group is society in general. An example would be how pop culture can affect our perceptions on different paranormal occurrences. We have what people truly experience opposed to what movies and media tell us is out there and how they can conflict with one another. This is something that we as investigators take into account any time we interview a potential witness. Another group is the family unit. The parasociological angle will look at how paranormal events can influence a family unit and the impact that in turn has on each other. Parasociologists who work paranormal family cases will take this into consideration, how that affects the mental health, uh, not just of the individuals, but the entire family unit as well. Psychologists, psychotherapists, and paranormal investigators who are experienced and work these kind of cases usually understand this as well and incorporates this into their investigations uh, through interview sessions, whether they are conscious, they are applying parasociological angles or not. And another group many times overlooked uh, by parasociologists who study social implications uh, in the paranormal are the paranormal societies or investigation organizations themselves, which do the investigation and research. We can see how paranormal television shows can influence how some paranormal teams may conduct their investigations as a group, for example. They're also affected are how to deal with uh, the witnesses or property owners who experience paranormal activity, or even the entities. Individuals are influenced by social presence and the actions of the group they associate with. And because cable shows can be filled with this information, this can take those parasociological perspectives in various directions. The field of parasociology is starting to take hold thanks to sociologists who understand that paranormal events of any kind can and do affect groups of people and thus they wish to study those implications. Many parasociologists use parapsychology as their base and work off that premise, which is understandable. But that doesn't limit parasociology to parapsychology. In fact, it enhances it. The possibilities within parasociology are certainly quite vast. One can study the implications in any one field for years, and there are many fields. Eventually, we'll see research into some of these disciplines, which we have seen in any large amount of case study concerning parasociology and other disciplines as the field grows. One may need a degree in sociology to be a parasociologist, but one doesn't need a degree to appreciate and benefit from this newer branch of paranormal research. And if one wants more information on parasociology, you can do an online search by typing in the name or go to the Facebook like page, as we mentioned before, who is sponsoring the segment, Parasociology. Um, so, time do we got? What does everyone think? Who would like to start? I'd like to say something about that. It's like all that's coming to the, to, uh, the surface. Everything's coming to the surface. It's like, um, the more acceptance that there is um, life on other planets and intelligent life is is being discussed. Um, there's more discussion about um, um, people that have hauntings. Um, it everything is like and, and and just the fact that we talked about Area 51 and how um, so many people are interested in and don't believe the government about that they don't have um, engineered alien engineering and the fact of this, that we have contact with other other um, aliens out there. It's like parasociology is just really coming 
coming into its own. There are so many uh, facets within it. Uh, another, another example is, you know, we see now ufology being talked about in mainstream media. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that will affect culture, pop culture. That will affect the masses. And that in itself is a topic for parasociology. And it's some not- people think it's a form of propaganda and mind control because of the information that's being provided and what isn't being provided. Exactly. Yeah, and, and like it, yeah, like the article said, and, the, and that disinformation can take uh, them avenues in weird directions sometimes. Absolutely. I thought this was in- interesting because it underscored this phenomenon that I experienced as coming in exclusively with an interest in an exclusive interest in UFOs. You guys have introduced me to the wild and wonderful world of other paranormal aspects, uh, the the cryptos, the animals, and ghost hunting and uh, lucid dream. Well, I was into lucid dreaming before, but uh, near death experiences. That's a huge one. Yes. And you get into all kinds of paranormal stuff, the strange disappearances in the national parks, uh, crop circles for that matter, all kind of thing going on all around us all the time. And now a bunch of specialists are forming up at last. But what's interesting and a little distressing to me is that the term parapsychologist and parapsychology and para anything, any of these disciplines, they are so, the umbrella is so big is what I'm trying to say, that UFO researchers are lumped with ghost hunters and other paranormalists. What do you guys think of that? Is it too broad a category? I don't think so because I actually am working in Paris, well, working in Paris psychology, as far as the studies that we're doing, we are both working on finishing degrees that are going to cover that because we think that you're going to need to do that to do what we do. But we do have a PhD who is available to help us with anything that may we may find difficult. We haven't yet, but we will, I'm sure. But I think that there is always going to be a crossover with these things. Ufology, well, is it interdimensional? Are these things just popping in, popping out? There are reports of that. The same with the cryptids. The same with spirits. And there's so many tie-ins through the research over the years. I feel like it's not too broad. I feel like these things are, are absolutely, there are correlations that are being found. And people who are getting serious about studying it are trying to figure out why those are there. What is feeding that? What's creating it? So I don't think that that it's too broad. I think that it's interesting that, you're being exposed to a lot more and your reactions to it are really from the point of what I'm looking at, your reactions are cool. (laughs) I love it. And I think that was a great question. And I think that this, I think that you cannot really do the, the study without having a parasociologist involved when you're dealing with families because there's just too much unknown out there. Jennifer, I know you find things that are very disturbing to people sometimes. And I think it's imperative that you have a resource to help with that. Oh, absolutely. You can't not, you know, do what we do and not have that. Absolutely. And with that, it's it's time for our next commercial break. This is the Paralogian Report. You are listening to Paraversal Universe. We'll be right back with our panel for the final segment. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Come on, I'm Southern, but...
Um, nope. That'll do. Hello, I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown. All of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcast. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 45 minutes after the hour. Hello, everyone. Uh, Welcome back. This is Paraversal Universe on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Uh, And uh, also heard on WCET-FM, High Point Radio, and the Rift Radio Network. We're your host, Kevin and Jennifer Malik, and we're glad you are with us as always. Sorry, a little distraction there. Uh, there are some Facebook face, uh, there are some Facebook group pages we want you to check out. Ultimate Conspiracies Group Page is one, uh, which is dedicated to conspiracies, crimes, and corruption. Also check out Lake Monstrosities, dedicated to aquatic mysteries and wonders of all kinds. Feel free to join them both. We would love to see you there. Also, each network mentioned has a face, <clears throat> I'm sorry, a, a Facebook uh, group and like page as well. So check those out for upcoming content, upcoming guests, upcoming shows, all that stuff. This segment is brought to you by the five star Reader's Choice Epic uh, or award winning Epic Fantasy Trilogy Helm by Robert L. Malik. And back to the show. This is the. This is Paraversal Universe and the Paralogian Report. And so I am going to pitch the ball to Jennifer. Right. So for the final segment here, the article I thought of the interest was for two reasons. One, of notoriety of the location as it is located on Loch Ness. And we all know that we can, you know, discuss the Loch, the Loch Ness monster at some point here. But also, this is a huge... Uh, not huge. This is something I wanted to read when I when I came across it because this is not the first time that this has happened around the figure that I am about to talk about. Um, so this article comes from the Daily Mail. It is dated August 1st, 2019. Ruined home of real life wicker man and notorious occult practitioner Alistair Crowley is torched by arsonists just three months after it was put up for sale. For five thousand, for five hundred thousand dollars, the home of real life wicker man and former occultist has been torched by arsonists near the shores of Loch Ness in Scotland just a week after a buyer was found. Bolskeen House in in the Scottish Highlands was once the home of Alistair Crowley, who reportedly practiced the occult there between 1899 and 1933. The property was also owned by Led Zeppelin's Jimmy Page from 1970 to 1992. The derelict house was put up on the market in April of this year for $10,000. Police were called in after fires were spotted around 3.30 yesterday at two buildings at the deserted site, including two, including the derelict main house 
and an external outbuilding. The estate's main house has had its interior destroyed by the fire. Police believe fires were deliberately started by arsonists. Firefighters extinguished the blazes and nobody was injured, although the damage was caused although damage was caused to the buildings. Calling himself a prophet, Crowley said that he would be the one to guide humanity into the so-called Aeon of Horus, an age of spiritual interest and self-realization. He died at the age of 72 in Hastings, Essex, Sussex, in 1947. Our inquiries are at an early stage, although our initial assessment is that this fire was started deliberately. We would encourage anybody... We would encourage anybody may have seen activity around Boyle Skeen House or nearby to come forward as soon as they can. It should go without saying that deliberately setting fires is incredibly dangerous as you have limited control over how they may develop. The 18th century house was in the midst of a restoration project with heritage buffs trying to raise $220,000 $220,000 to bring it back to its original condition. A spokesman for the Bolskine House Foundation said it was a great sadness that we report that the remainder of the building's interior has now been destroyed and along with important historical clues to the features of importance of peace of Scottish heritage. We would like to thank the firefighters who put their lives at risk to save what is left of the building. We can also confirm that this is suspected arson and investigators by police will be ongoing. I chose this article, as I stated earlier, one, because it is on Loch Ness, and two, that this is not the only time that this house has seen its share of fires. And I wanted to get everybody's thoughts on this article. I found it interesting that this wasn't the first time this had happened to that structure. And I also found the comments behind that article very interesting. People did not have a positive reaction to that home. And that's because Crowley was quite polarizing. And I've read Crowley books, and he was a genius. Some people would call him an evil genius, but everything he did made sense to him. He was a Western Thalamic magician, and that didn't sit well in Christian Britain quite often, and and I guess Loch Ness is in Scotland, Great Britain, shall we say, that there is an ancient history of paganism, of course, in Great Britain, and Crowley came barreling out with occult secrets, and he was an arrogant, pompous ass as well. He was super smart, and that's really irritating to a lot of people. So it's no surprise that his house would be targeted. It is a shame that as a landmark, it has Mm -hmm. been torched. And I just wrote an article on another natural landmark, not a house, but a rock formation in Great Britain that was vandalized in a matter of a couple of hours, some 300 million year old rock formation, something along the lines of a mini, not a Grand Canyon per se, but Canyon land, shall we say, Canyon land. Scottish style or wherever this was and might have been Ireland. In any event, uh, in fact, it might have been Britain, England, these teenagers basically went and tipped over a teetering rock and smashed it down. And there goes history. I mean, this is crazy. This is crazy stuff. It is. It is. And I, you know, and I think, and you know, I, I can personally, from my viewpoint here, I, I do know over the years, everyone, I'm sure everybody's known, there are people that followed Crowley's work and they were into the same kind of rituals and stuff that he did. And they went to that house and they did stuff there. And part of me thinks, now this may just be me here, that maybe some of the locals just got tired of it and, and took matters into their own hands. Just like summer wind. You know, so many people were going there and partying and just to visit the place because it was such an icon, an abandoned location, that uh, one of the theories on its demise was that the town just got tired of it and torched it one night uh, to stop people from going out there. 
Now, it didn't, never stopped no. anyone from going out there. I still go to out there to this day. It's still a rite of passage for many kids, but um, right. we got to wrap the show up. Right, and I just want to say really quickly for a few seconds here, it may get to the point where even though it may not be there with Slash the Destructor, people are still going to go out there regardless. Yes, they're still and going to. I wanted to, to yes. say that the rocks that I'm talking about were the Brimham Rocks in the Moors National Park in England, setting the record straight there. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, interestingly, the Crowley's house had just been sold. They had just closed on it, closed the deal, and then it got torched. And it's interesting, Jimmy Page had owned mm-hmm. it. He, you know, there's this occult thread that runs through these owners, oh, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, they're deep into that. Yeah. They're yeah. deep yeah. into that. So, uh, we'd like to thank our panel of, actually, well, do we have a couple minutes? We do. We, we have do. enough time. Um, let's, well, yeah, we, we go till, um, six, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. So we have six minutes. Right, so, yeah. Okay. Tick, tick, tick. So we still have Doc to chime in and Tom. Yay. You're still with us, Doc? No, I left. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it just dawned on me. I heard he you. He just stepped into another dimension. <laughs> I, uh, no, I just mute my phone so that I don't, if I sneeze or cough or something, I don't interrupt the important work you guys are doing. But, um. So that when you call on me, I have to quickly grab my phone and take it off mute. But um, uh, my just final words are to all you psychics and mediums, if you know a psychic and medium out there, we're still conducting the survey that's identifying the link between psychic and mediumship with autoimmune diseases. And this goes on through uh, through Thanksgiving. So if just anybody that knows us. Just that link right now, please. It's uh, projectpsi.com, and you'll see right at the top, it'll say uh, Psychic Survey. And so take that uh, that survey. Uh, I think there's a very, very strong link between psychic activity and uh, 87.3% of the psychics I studied last year, which were 780 of them, all have an, an autoimmune condition. And I think it's in the mitochondrial DNA, and I need more data. So, uh, so go check that out, please. Tom, Tom, do you have any thoughts on the article? Um, I not not really. Um, um, it's really interesting what the doctor was talking about about autoimmune. That's pretty, pretty interesting results for psychics. It's, I just was surprised that that was, that was one of your results. So, um, Jean, do you want to share your website? Yes. You know I do. www.lightwork111.com. You can find me, articles by me as lightworker111. On various websites now, the daily conspiracy.com, misanthrope.today, and survival.update. All those, those are not attributed. And then of course I invite you to check out my book on Amazon, Unknown Objects, the top 10 US UFO cases, covering cases from the end of World War II up to the Phoenix Lights in 1997. It's been great to be here. Thank you. And I, I did just finish your book, um, and it, everybody should read it and catch up on uh, the history of the, those UFOs. Awesome. And it, it really sheds light on what's going on now, this whole innocence. Oh, we're only just discovering Tic Tac UFOs and stuff like that. We cry shenanigans. Right. <laughs> oh, I know. Cat. Delicately put. Cat. My opinion on the article or how to find me? <laughs> or how to find you. All of the above. From all of the this. above. Um, you can find me and all of the other shows that we have here on WBHM-DB.com. We have something every night, but Tuesday and Thursdays. And we are always running archives, but we are live Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday. Oh, we're not... 
live Saturdays. My bad, guys. But we are running content 24-7. We have great shows like this one through the week. And there will be one following this also, Ghost Talk Radio. But you can find me on Facebook. We have a like page for Fate Mag Radio. We have a like page for Paranormal Experienced with Kat Hobson. We have a like page for the network, WBHMDB. And you can also find me, newly, I'm very excited about this. I am now co-founder with my research partner, Frank Lee, of the American Noetic Sciences Research Studies. And we are looking forward to getting some of our work um, out there and continuing it. We are quite quite excited to become even more involved with what we've been fascinated by for years. So I am the online voice of Fate Magazine. So come listen. We have all kinds of fun stuff. All those things strange and anomalous and true. Alrighty. Thank you to our correspondents. I would like to thank our panel of Paralogians for being so informative and awesome. Much gratitude. You guys are great. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Next week's guest is cryptozoologist Julie Wrench from Monster X. So don't miss that. Feel free to support any of the networks mentioned here tonight, as well as the Northern Wisconsin Paranormal Society Limited 501c3 nonprofit organization by donating. It's folks like you who ensure that these excellent organizations will be here tomorrow. To the believer, the evidence is overwhelming. And to the skeptic, there will never be enough. Thank you. Good night. God bless you. Have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you here next time. Good night, everyone. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Warning, the following message does not necessarily reflect the views of WBHMDB or its hosts, guests, listeners, or of any functioning adult in general. In fact, Frank should probably seek professional help. Listener discretion is advised. Hi there, Frank Lee here. I thought that I would spend a few moments telling you about the positivity from the network here. Uh, the overall message of para unity and happiness and how everyone here wants to get along with everyone out there and how everything is just wonderful wait cat's not looking <laughs> okay i've got something to really tell you So I'm going to tell you what's really going on. Honestly, all that being nice and positive crap is kind of hurting my soul, as dark as it is. So, what's really happening? Well, you see it all the time. Everybody and their brother out there has a paranormal team because they watch a couple of episodes of Ghost Hunters or some crap like that. So they go and they spend half their mortgage payment on tools and things that light up that they don't understand. And then the next logical step after buying matching black t-shirts and posing like 90s rappers for their Facebook page is to, of course, have their own podcast. Well, you know what? You're not going to find that crap here. What we have here at WBHM Digital Broadcasting is the best host, the best guest, bringing you real information. All of the hosts here on this network know their stuff. They are the people who have been out there doing the work, doing actual research. And no, by research, I don't mean binge watching some kind of cheesy TV show on Netflix. I mean reading books. I mean out in the field doing the lay work. And who are they interviewing on their shows? They're bringing you the people they have learned from. They're bringing you the best in the field. 
covering all kinds of topics from UFOs and aliens to Bigfoot to cryptozoology to ghosts to anything you can think of a bit strange and unexplained. It is here, and you're going to get the best information here. So stay tuned to WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Don't go anywhere. Speaking of going somewhere, I've got to go before my mic gets cut. We'll see you there on WBHM DB.